in the Hermetica that I translated, the Kori Kazmu, I mean, it's very clear that these are Egyptian nationalists who are saying, Egypt is the center of the world. The Greeks, they barely know how to speak. It's just sophistical brouhaha, puff of smoke, logistical games. We speak the, in the language of the gods, as it, as it were. The real wisdom is ours. So there's definitely that national element. I mean, it's, it's all ironical because all this stuff ends up in Greek. In Greek. And also, they, they one of the criticisms, right, is they say that, that Greek lacks inner Gaia. And there's no equivalent to modern. They're using Greek philosophical language to criticize paucity of Greek. Like there's no equivalent Egyptian term. It seems like it's it's, it's a it's an argument against the Greeks that relies on the very their very philosophy. They're using the master's tools to take the master's house apart. And a great example is but Iamblichus in in De Mysteries, or basically pretends to be an Egyptian priest, and he can pull this off. But he does a brilliant job pretending to be an Egyptian priest, speaking Egyptian wisdom which is actually I mean, his, his own rendition of it. The Demotic Book of Toth for the first time, and when you actually read something written by Egyptian priests and you compare it to Gamblicus or the Corpus Hermeticum to realize how wildly different they are as, as, as texts. But I do wonder about indigenous Egyptian priestly wisdom versus the importation of Greek speculative philosophy. Our guest this evening requires no introduction. Both gentlemen are providing invaluable public-facing scholarship via their respective YouTube and Patreon platforms. Although they need no introduction, um, it's, it would be remiss of me not to. So um, first, he's the devil on the run, a six-gun lover, a candle in the wind. He is the curator and host of the channel Esoterica, the alchemical governor himself, Dr. Justin Fledge. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me on. It's a real pleasure. Welcome. And in this corner, the reigning, defending, undisputed heavyweight champion of second century alternative Christianities. Yamblichus himself risen, Dr. Matthew David Litwell. Welcome. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Good to be awesome. here. Awesome. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are going to, in the immortal words of the band Rat, lay it down. We are talking about the Corpus Hermetica. So, gentlemen, what's the deal with hermetism? Basically, yeah, we're, we're looking at uh, an ancient Egyptian phenomenon that may go back into, you know, we don't know how early it actually goes back because there are treatises ascribed to Hermes as early as the third and second century BCE, um, dealing with all sorts of, of topics native to Egyptian wisdom. And they're, they're not in Greek. Uh, we start getting the Greek treatises in the, the common era, uh, which is right around the birth of Christianity. But even those treatises are hard to date and they have, you know, we have the Byzantine collection, the Corpus Hermeticum, mm -hmm. and then we have a large set of excerpts from Stobaeus, which I've translated. We've got a few hermetic fragments um, that have been scrounged up in European libraries that are, are brand new. We've got the Coptic Hermetica now in, in Nagamati. And all of these seem to be the products of, yeah, roughly, you know, up to about the sixth century. And then of course, there's a huge hermetic reception uh, which is still going on today. So uh, obviously Christian authors, Christian patristic authors start, you know, facing off with Hermes, with, with Tertullian in, in late second or early, early third century. And uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's a friend, he's a foe to some. Um, he's something of a mixed character. He is somewhat like Paul, uh, anything to anybody. Um, but yeah, he's the master of all Egyptian lore and it's simply hermetism uh, to me and Justin, I'm sure can, can add to this or change this, but it, it's just really in the most broad sense, it's any phenomena, any, any text that describes itself, any practice, that ascribes itself, that ascribes its wisdom to Hermes Thrice Great, which is that particular Egyptian sage, uh, supposedly 
before the time of Moses also somehow identified with uh, the god Thoth or Thoth or Thoth, if you will. Yeah, I think that the only thing I would uh, say much the same way and maybe slightly differently is that uh, I think of Hermeticism as sort of two distinct branches of of uh, of um, intellectual and technical and in, inheritance. Uh, the one branch is a spiritual technology. It's a soteriology. It's a theory of salvation um, that is primarily born in, in ancient Egypt um, and captured largely in the Hermetico, Corpus Hermeticum as we have it. Um, and then there's a, a whole other body of literature, a technical Hermetica, although this is a modern distinction that, that I don't think ancient peoples didn't and wouldn't make uh, on principled grounds, I think. Um, and that literature is primarily concerned with other kinds of wisdom, um, which is also quasi salvific in some ways, which would include things like uh, astrology, alchemy, and um, a wide range of other technologies. So I would say that there's um, uh, we can make a distinction as much as that distinction is artificial. And um, and that would include the soteriological literature, but also the technical literature. And um, so I, I think that that those two things are sort of wrapped up together. And now it's been ex explored all the way to the 20th century with things like the Kabbalion, which is a very polarizing and um, divisive text in some ways. But uh, I guess from the philosophical point of view, if it calls itself hermetic, then I'm going to, you know, and people call it hermetic, I'm going to have to anthropologically kind of group it in there, whether I think it should or shouldn't be. Um, but yeah, as, as, uh, as David said, this, there's literature that going back all the way into, into demotic, uh, you know, things like the demonic book of Toth, which is probably something like, you know, Thothic literature. But um, yeah, a huge, a huge array of literature in this way, uh, some of which is soteriological, some of which is technical. Right. And then dealing with the Corpus Hermeticum itself, um, scholars usually agree, right, that these were written probably between the first and the third centuries common era. Um, and you touched upon it already, Dr. Sledge. Uh, this is uh, a debate that's been going on for a while, um, how Greek or how Egyptian these um, elements in the Hermetica are. And, uh, you know, you have vastly different ideas about it. Like you have Festugier thought one thing, he's like, oh, there's nothing Egyptian in there at all. Then you have Fowden who's like, no, it's, you know, and Chris Christian Bull recently who were like, no, there's, there's more Egyptian in there than you know, we probably thought in the past. So um, I would think it was safe to say that both of you fall in the camp that um, those elements are more Egyptian than they are just like Greek with little sprinklings of Egyptian uh, kitsch on top. I, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. This it's is where not a maybe, horse race, though. Yeah, that's maybe where, ahead, where Dr. Liva and I may disagree. I, I tend to be closer to Festuger, actually, in a lot of ways. Mm. Yeah, I, I tend to be the. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna get myself canceled. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I tend to see very little Egypt when I read the demonic book of Toth and it, like the sort of it, what we have of the indigenous Egyptian literature. I see so little of that kind of temple literature in the in the Corpus Semiticum. Um I, I think it's Egyptian. I think it's an indigenous Egyptian people. Maybe some people from the priest class. Um, but I see, it's just, I mean, I can say more about this maybe, but Valter and I came to the same conclusion at around the same time for very different reasons, Valter Hanegraaff. Um, but I, I, it to me strikes me as sort of, um, uh, practicalized middle, middle Platonism in a lot of ways. So I see most of the Egyptian stuff as, as, um, as window dressing. I'm not, I'm not impressed by uh, Fowden's argument about how much Egyptian um, temple wisdom is making it making its way into those texts. But well, right, yeah, it, it's it's. I, I would say, yeah, today, yeah, everyone should go read Christian Bull's book. Uh, yeah. But it, as I said before, it's it's not a horse race. I get, uh, you, you know, New Testament scholars get into this trap, you know, of of you know Jew or Greek, you know, uh, and and you you. You can still get into this trap of Egyptian or Greek, and really, I don't think in antiquity uh, we can we can work with those binary categories. Those are all overlapping categories, and the the sources of identity, the springs of identity, are coming from both 
streams. I mean, I would say that definitely in the Hermetica that I translated, uh, which is the, the Kori Kazmu and the, the tractates associated with the Kori Kazmu. I mean, it's very clear that these are Egyptian nationalists mm -hmm. who are saying Egypt is the center of the world. The Greeks, they barely know how to speak. It's just sophistical, you know, uh, brouhaha, puff of smoke, uh, logistical games, you know, sophistical arguments. We have the true language. We speak the, you know, the in, in the language of the gods as it, as it were. And, you know, everything else is mumbo jumbo. And so the real wisdom is ours. So there's definitely that national element. But yeah, one of the, I mean, it's, it's all ironical because all this stuff ends up in Greek. In Greek. And, and also they, they, one of the criticisms, right, is they say that, that Greek lacks inner Gaia and there's no right. equivalent demonic. They're, they're using Greek philosophical language to criticize the, 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 the paucity of Greek. Like there's no equivalent Egyptian term. It seems like it's 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 a it's it is a weird kind of argument. I think uh, yeah. that they that they it's a it's an argument against the Greeks that relies on the very their very philosophy. They're using the masters' tools to take the masters' house apart. Um, Absolutely, and a great example is is and one might call it appropriation, but Iamblichus in in De Mysteriis or what's called now called De Mysteriis basically pretends to be an Egyptian priest and he can pull this off. I mean, incredibly, I mean, you have to ask, you know, how much, you know, Egyptian literature did he, did he read to be able to pull this off? But he pulls it off beautifully. It just pretends to be Abamon, the, the Egyptian priest. We're not even sure if I am because ever went to Egypt, but he does a brilliant job pretending to be an Egyptian priest, speaking Egyptian wisdom, which is actually, I mean, his, his own rendition of it. Um, and, you know, I think the real question there is, yeah, in, in Iamblichus, is there anything really Egyptian? In, in right. And I, I wonder if an Egyptian <laughs> priest, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know about you, doc, uh, Dr. Libwell, when I read uh, the Demotic Book of Toth for the first time, and when you actually read something written by Egyptian priests and you compare it to Iamblichus or the Corpus Semeticum to realize how wildly different they are as, as, as text. And I agree with you that the distinction Greek and Egyptian at this time doesn't, isn't a useful distinction, but I do wonder about indigenous Egyptian priestly wisdom versus, um, Greek, the importation of Greek speculative philosophy. And I do think those are distinct strands of wisdom traditions that have a distinct language and distinct technical jargon and distinctive worldviews. And that's what I, where I would want to draw the, where I'd want to wonder about the importation. It's not a distinction between Greek and Egyptian. It's a distinction between wisdom traditions and where, where I would say where I'm not, I don't see much of the, the Egyptian wisdom tradition impressed upon the Corpus Semeticum. Um, yep. Yeah. That's, that's so, what I'm not seeing. I yeah, guess, no, that's and that's fine. the distinction I would want to make. And on the level of social history, I mean, one simply has to engage Christian Bull's argument that the writers of this material are, in fact, disenfranchised Egyptian priests. Mm -hmm. That has to be queried and, and questioned. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic idea, but it, it has to be queried and, and questioned. The other thing, when we're dealing with distinct wisdom traditions, we need to think about abstract thought. I mean, hu human cultures think, I think Egyptians are just, are just as capable of thinking abstractly mm -hmm. Uh, as the Greeks were, but they did so in different codes and, and right. modes. And, you know, in, in the 20th century, there was this attempted distinction. They also made it, you know, for the Gnostics, unfortunately, but between mythological thinking and philosophical thinking. Right. But really, these are both equally abstract ways of thinking, sure. you know, and whether you're thinking about like the eight frogs, the eight original frogs of the cosmos, or, you know, the shell of the turtle that rose out of the sea, or, you know, the, the, the God, you know, who cries and those tears become human beings. I mean, that, that's still abstract thought, right? <laughs> uh, it's not, you know, 57 aeons, one name virtue, one name love, one name human, one name church kind of tradition. Um, but it's still, it, there's still modes of abstract thought. They're just, they're just different modes of abstract mm -hmm. thought. And yeah, when you look at world mythologies. I mean, they're thinking on very, at a very big, broad based level, but yes, they have very different ways of, of phrasing, particularly creation traditions.
Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate fact of, of, of scientific discourse today, you know, presents itself as the universalizing and best discourse. And really this goes all the way back to, to the Greeks who basically invented, you know, the scientific treatise. And if you sound scientific, then you're, right. you're good. And, and that made these other cultures, you know, the Babylonians and the Egyptians and the Persians who didn't have this, um, scientific framing or this epi Greek epistemology, it made them seem like they were myth makers. But this is a very Western way of, of viewing it. Right. I, th I think I think it's safer to say that there's just different modes and codes of abstract thought in a variety of, of cultures. And we can't get swept away by someone who says, well, the Greeks were scientific. They gave us science. Well, I mean, they right, certainly and that's like funny, the rhetoric. When the, <laughs> of course, and, and it's funny, like when the Corpus Semeticum wants to talk about creation, they re don't, re they don't, they rely neither on Greek speculation nor on Egyptian speculation. They rely on Jewish speculation. That's the most hilarious yep, part. Yep. That, yep. Yeah, that's that's the only non-pagan, uh, you know, uh, source that the Corpus Semeticum relies on. Basically, some version of the Genesis creation myth, because it seems like maybe the the Jews had sort of the monopoly on 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 that being the the you know, the best creation method that going at the time. Um, so it's funny that, again, the eclecticism there in order to sound a certain kind of way, which, uh, again, it's, it's funny to me that the same Egyptian nationalists that could have written the Asclepius are also happy to lean on um, uh, the Jewish creation myth, um, the Israelite creation myth, uh, and the Jews were terribly unpopular in some ways in Alexandria, both by the Romans and by the Egyptians. The Egyptians, you know, destroyed that you know, there are riots against the Jews and Alexandria and Elephantine Island and stuff like that. So it's it's just, yeah, uh, the rhetoric matters in, in some ways. But at the end of the day, the hermeticists are not interested in um, who they pull from. They're interested in a, in a soteriological story of, of salvation. And I think that that's what, to them at the end of the day, you know, I think that many Neoplatonist philosophers, Numenius or whatever, who would have looked down their nose at the Corpus Hermeticum as, the way that I think that uh, people look down their nose at New Age spirituality now is sort of, you know, watered down, you know, uh, silly, you know, crystals and stuff. I think that middle many Neoplatonist philosophers in Alexandria would have looked at the the Corpus Hermeticum and go, "This is just low rent, bad philosophy." Um, but that's not what they were interested in. That's not that wasn't the goal of what they were what they were up to in the end. And that's yeah, certainly yeah. what. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Dr. Little. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, that's certainly the attitude that Porphyry seems to have. Porphyry and Plotinus seem to have this very snooty attitude towards it. They don't really engage in it. You don't really see them engaging in things like that until um, somebody like Iamblichus comes along. Um, they're more interested in things like the Chaldean oracles, strangely enough, which also takes from the same kind of sources so mm -hmm. right. who knows <laughs> well i think i think it's worth noting though that it, certain christian authors are genuinely concerned about hermetic thought i mean that augustine mm -hmm. begins to sweat um in in the fifth century and he spends a lot of time trying to defeat what he considers to be hermetic ideology in in the asclepius mm -hmm. um if you've read the city of god i think he's really he's sweating enough i mean he takes it seriously enough to write in a very sophisticated critique i mean somewhat sophistical critique but he's 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 concerned um and yeah i think you know it's it's difficult to say because i am because yes Porphyry, yes, uh, that he he has would have doubts about the the Egyptian um, wisdom traditions, and he, he'd probably try to you know figure out if these were forgeries, you know, knowing his bent, you know. But Iamblichus is a great example of yes, yeah, someone who who is is trying to take the material seriously, it has at least convinced himself that he's dealing with authentic, I think, uh, hermetic traditions and mm -hmm. is willing even to present himself as a, a hermitist or, or an, an Egyptian priest. And the thing about di dipping into Jewish tradition, I think that's a fascinating point because, you know, Moses, I think a lot of Egyptians thought of Moses as an Egyptian, actually. And so if, if, if a, 
if a hermetic thinker, I mean, the, the, the exodus in Egypt or the, the Moses story in Egypt really began with, with Moses as Osar Sif or as, as an Egyptian priest who got leprosy and then led a bunch of rebels outside of Egypt. That was sort of their, their version of the, of the exodus in, in, in various manifestations. Uh, and there was even on the part of the Jews like Artapanus to present Moses mm -hmm. as the Egyptian Hermes, that he was called Hermes, that he did a bunch of, you know, hermetic style things. And so it's, it's, it's the Egyptians who, who are confused because actually Hermes really is Moses. But then, you know, I mean, is that really a critique? You know, I mean, there, this, all, all this attempt at, you know, carving out your identity really ends up in, in a lot of mixed identities for these people. So whether, you know, if an Egyptian priest uh, or, or if a hermeticist picks up Genesis, does he think or she think that it's a Jewish book? Um, I mean, us, we would certainly ostensibly <clears throat> assume that. But if they think of Moses as the author and if they think Moses is an Egyptian, maybe even some kind of, you know, unfortunately leprous Egyptian priest or, <laughs> you know, I mean, we don't know exactly what right. they, what they thought. Like this, this could be just another case of, we might call it appropriation, but if they viewed it as Egyptian, they would, they would just take it as their own tradition, basically. Interesting. This is fascinating. Um, so I want to circle onto a different, slightly different subject, but also circling around to this concept of community. So um, in his quintessential book, the, the Middle Platonist, John Dillon coined this term, the Platonic Underground. So when he's discussing Hermeticism, he kind of lumps it all together with things like the Greek magical papyri, Chaldean oracles, things like that, uh, Gnostic movements, uh, for lack of a better term. All of these things uh, just seem to me like they're, they're kind of moving in the same circles in, in very many senses. So I was wondering if we could kind of touch briefly upon the uh, dynamic cultural exchange of um, things like Hermeticism, things like the Greek magical papyri, um, you know, these practices Dr. Sledge was talking about, you know, the, the technology of salvation and, um, you know, Sethian Gnostic movements uh, within this cultural milieu. Um, so Dr. Sledge, did you want to start? I mean, whatever they were, they weren't underground. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, again, you know, to to Dr. Lewis' point, you know, if if, Aug if Augustine feels the need to polemicize them and Lactantius feels the need to claim them, um, you know, we're not dealing with a situation where they're underground. That that means that Christians are dealing with pop. That means Christians in the fourth century or so are dealing with populations of people for whom this is a, a this is a, soter a soteriological mode, like. You know, you can shop around. There's lots of ways to get salvation in the ancient Mediterranean world. This is a competition around uh, soteriologies. And if if Augustine over there in Hippo feels the need to polemicize against it, well, that just tells me that there are chunks of people, communities of people, uh, thousands of people uh, that at some level for whom, you know, this is a way of getting salvation. And therefore, he has to argue against it. You don't argue against, you don't argue against four weirdos in a... <laughs> you know, the desert of Alexandria. It, it just, exactly. you know, you, I just don't, I don't see that. So um, I think these are communities. I, I, you know, I, I, again, I tend to agree with, uh, with uh, Hanegraaff here. I think these are communities and they're communities of salvation. And now again, I would also put the Stoics and the Epicureans and the skeptics. They're also part of this coping philosophy, trying to deal with the chaos of their world or whatever. And so, um, so I think that these are these are communities of people attempting to achieve salvation, much in the same way that the early Christianity, the early Christian movement was, uh, the apocalyptic Jewish movement was, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't like the term, you know, Platonic underground because it assumes that, like, you know, I mean, if anyone's the underground, it's all these weird philosophers, but they're like three students sitting around, you know, talking to a handful of guys in this ter terribly technical language about. You know all the you know the 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 stuff that Plotinus goes on and on and on about, or you know whatever Proclus and things. That's the minority, right? That's that was what underground. Fowden argued, right, with his uh, with his uh, thesis about the pagan holy man in antiquity. These these people had very very small circles, comparatively speaking. But with things like the Greek magical papyri or 
you know, the Corpus Hermeticum, I mean, just the fact that they're so widely diffused. Yeah. And the fact that kind we of find... speaks to their popularity, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Nagamati six. You know, when we find all these diverse sort of texts and translated into Coptic, you don't translate. You don't go through the work of translating stuff into into Coptic. You know, if no one's reading it or no one's using it or whatever. So, uh, and that's just you know Armenian. Like this stuff ends up in Armenian and other kinds of things like that. I just, I just, it seems to me that these were populist ideas. And and if you read, I mean, Plotinus is a little bit further downstream because I don't think he's quite there yet. But I think if you read some of these technical philosophical works, I don't think that they're accessible to, to popular teachings. Um, it seems to me that the Hermeticum, the Corpus, texts like the Corpus Hermeticum or the Chaldean Oracles, less so because it's so strange. Um, but the, but in many ways, I see the Corpus Hermeticum as a popularized sort of New Agey version of the soteriological theories that are uh, that are popular in the day, and uh, the Corpus Hermeticum gives them some degree of philosophical rigor, although that's not their primary interest. But uh, I do think that this is not an underworld at all. I think this is just the the world of practical spiritual technologies of which there are, um, there are a dozen, dozens of these floating around the, the Mediterranean world. Well, all I know is Platonic Underground is a great name for a band. Yeah, I agree. And I agree. speaking of which, Dr. Sledge, you have some new merchandise out, don't you? I do, yeah. It's funny because I borrowed the, the term from Richard Kiekeffer of the Clerical Necromantic Underground, which is just a fantastic metal band name. So this would be the Platonic Underground would just be the the precursor to the Clerical Necromantic Underground of the of the whatever the 14th uh, century. Yeah, so, that's my industrial uh, side project name. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I think I, I had another one called Baroque Hypostatic Entities um, for, for, for all of, for all these. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think that uh, in the way that the necro clerical necromantic underground was an actual underground, I think that that is not true. I think Dylan, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, misuses that that phrase and and um, well, in he, his he book on the Middle Plateness. He speaks like a true classicist, and and John Dylan is a is a dear soul um, yeah. and a kind kind man. Um, but yeah, that the classicist purview centralizes a certain amount of a certain subsection often of greek tradition and then when you have a focus you also have a margin mm -hmm. and i think yeah calling something the platonic underworld is is a way to to marginalize it say that it's not the focus it's not really what you know the uh 19th century British gentleman ought to be studying. Um, it's uh, something peripheral and weird. And yeah, in that sense, it's it's an esotericization of this material, which probably wasn't esoteric. I mean, at least in the circles that it that it originally cropped up in. Um, so, so yeah, you you end up you, this you end up just you know, doing politics, whereas we should be doing the real job of scholarship and, and studying everything and taking taking seriously what this material has to say, regardless of, of you know, where we think that it, it comes from. Amazing, amazing. Was there um, another part of your question there? I forgot it. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> this is all great. Like, I love that it's just kind of going wherever you guys take it. So I'm going with the flow. Um, but Dr. Lowe, I know you said you had to leave soon. So um, I'm going to leave you all with one final question, if that's OK. I'll sure. keep this brief. Um, so in academia, in terms of biblical scholarship, there is a, I know the concept of community nowadays is very um, controversial. Um, you know, a, a lot of our viewers are fans of Robin Faith Walsh and her criticism of, of her criticism of the concept of like a, a Matthean community or um, in the case of something like the Gospel of Thomas or the, the Thomas uh, writings in the Nag Hammadi codices, like a Thomasine community. Um, so are we are we kind of doing ourselves a disservice? I know we've kind of already touched upon this, but are we doing a disservice to the text by thinking of a hermetic community um, because we have all these like circling back to the beginning we have 
radically different scenarios about what these texts were for. Um, whether, you know, Reitzenstein or Fowden or Copenhaver, you know, I know Copenhaver thinks they're more like private devotional texts that, you know, you kind of, um, the holy word, that the, the sacrifice of the word. And then you have other people like Bull now who are more going towards, oh, it's more of like a community and Dr. Sledge believes it's, you know, community. So um, to borrow a phrase from Earl at the Schwepp, Thank you, Earl, for letting me use this phrase. Uh, what's your irresponsible speculation about these communities? What 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 would you say they were like, if there was one? Well, yeah, I think we need to be careful. And you know, Robin Faith Walsh has done a great service to scholarship with her book. But in a sense, it's low hanging fruit to to say that you know texts don't mean communities and communities don't always produce texts. And and it's really against New Testament scholarship that she takes aim mostly uh, in the irresponsible creation of communities from the study of texts. Uh, I mean, it partially goes back to church tradition where you see, uh, you know, these texts as representing church groups uh, with, you know, particular themes and emphases rather than the private musings of, of the author. And that's all, that's that's very good. But on the other hand, you can throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, because if you, if you just drop this loaded term, if you wanna call it romantic, that's fine, community, which uh, it, it's really Stan Stowers, who's Robin's teacher, who, who in an article on the concept of community said, you know, this term is just overloaded and overladen with romantic ideals of, of like a you know, close-knit fellowship and unity of mind. And th those assumptions need to be eliminated. But I think we, it's perfectly fun to talk about groups in a more in a neutral sense. And of course, sociolo sociologists have been talking about you know, social identity and group identity for, for decades. And yes, you can, you can see the dynamics of social identity and group identity working out in texts. I think, you know, responsible scholars can still say, okay, well, this text is talking about prayer at evening, at morning, face toward the sun, toward the east, at a certain time with certain words, talking about a certain meditation practice or talking about a certain eating practice. Um, you know, why wouldn't we think that this is the mechanics of group identity? Um, and, you know, no one can slap us on the wrist and say, well, um, no, you, you can't move from text to community. Well, you can if you do so responsibly. And if we just talk in the more neutral sense of groups, um, yes, I think that hermetic groups, there probably were something like hermetic groups. Did they have a unity of mind? Um, were they close knit, you know, spiritual fellowship? Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I'm also very happy with the audience cults. I mean, because when you have just group, you know, the group can be variously conceived and defined. You know, is it a group of readers going to book club? Is it people actually going to some secret cave at midnight on a Tuesday? You know, uh, you know, slitting a cat's throat or something. You know, God help us. Um, is it something is it something else what's what's the what's the firmness of the group's identity um you know maybe a text can't tell us that so you know let's unload this term and and talk more and maybe more sociologically sophisticated in a more sophisticated sense about what kind of group identity we have here with with the so-called hermetists dr sledge <clears throat> I guess I'm not I'm not a sociologist or anthropologist, but when I read the literature that survives, what I see are identity group identity markers like the Asclepius, like the Greeks are bad. That's like a negative identity marker. That's sort of like we are we are not them, and that tells me that they're identifying as something other. Also, we have some ritual practice that seems to survive in these hermetical te these hermetic texts, like some kind of you know. Rituals tend not to be things you do on your own. They tend to be things that are done in communal settings. Uh, we have the phrase way of Hermes. That tends to strike me as a, that when you say you're on the way of Hermes, it tends to be an exclusionary term that you're on this way and not some other way. Uh, 
um, they strike me as as a community. And again, I think that when I see Augustine polemicize against them or like Tantius claim them or um, when I see other texts like the Prayer of Thanksgiving or the what seems to be a, a kind of initiatory text on the Discourse of the Eighth and the Ninth, um, this looks like the remnants, you know. And again, I think uh, Dr. Lit was right. We have to be careful. But you know, if I were a betting man and you ask for, you know, uh, not so responsible speculation, I'm going to say that there were there were groups of people out there. And I, and I and I think not just groups of people, but I think people for whom this was an identity. This was a spiritual practice. This was a this was a, a, a coherentizing narrative for their for their uh, for their world. Um, and I think they must have been significant in number. Because, you know, I, I, again, I always, you know, survival bias is what it is. You know, we can never be clear about what, you know, what manuscripts survive versus what, you know, to what degree that's a reflection of what actually exists on the ground. But it is surprising to me how much of this literature survives. And that tells me at some level that um, what we have is a shadow of what was lost. And I suspect that this was, you know, a spiritual vocation for a community of people and, and, Alexandria and beyond. And so in that way, I do think we can talk about a community. And in the same way that I think that maybe the, the layer of resolution is wrong here, like talking about a, a, a Thomas community or a Mathean community or a Johannine community, I'm not so sure about that. I, I think that criticism I get, but talking about a Christian community, sure, like that existed. And in the same way, I think that we should talk about that in the way of Hermes. There was a Hermetic community. And there may have been disagreement, even within the Corpus Medicum, there are technical disagreements about things. Some texts are more dualistic, some texts are not. Um, but I don't think it's beyond dispute there was a Christian community or whatever. And in the same way that to think that there was a hermetic community of which there were actually rival positions, that seems very likely to me. Again, the Corpus Medicum seems to betray that. They're not internally logically coherent, not, not that that's their end goal anyway. Um, right. But, but you, in that you and way, I are going to be talking about coin boundaries. And uh, I didn't mean to interrupt, but just me and we're going to be talking about Paul Andres, and, and, and I, I see it as a very positive view of the world. But then you have other texts um, in the Corpus Hermeticum that are very um, have a less positive, more negative view of the world. So, right. like you're like you said, they're very inconsistent in terms of the right. worldview. So. And that's just that that to me also is you know again the the classic uh, the the Jew on the desert island, right? That you. You know, the Jew builds two synagogues. I think that 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 kind of contradiction tells me that there are, there's a community there because communities struggle over ideas, and the fact that the that the Corpus Medicum maintain remembers that struggle that there are different positions at work. That to me tells me that there's a there's a there's some level of intellectual discourse happening, and that discourse typically is is sort of pyramidal, right? That's the tip of the tip of it, and what and there's a much more larger population base beneath it that's a, that's yeah. uh, engaging in that. Which I love the idea of like the the, the more dualists and the less dualist hermeticists like arguing with each other about whatever you know, and that's all been lost to us. But I, I suspect it probably happened. And to it's like the uh, yeah. sorry, Doctor Lou, I keep yeah. interrupting y'all. No. I'm like I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know, I'm just gonna bring up like uh, it's like the gospel of uh, uh, the testimony of truth, right? Uh, who do we think wrote that? Dr. Lit was some scholars think that uh, Julius Africanus wrote that. It was like just the uh, the other not the Val the other Valentinians just weren't hardcore enough for them. So it's like the same thing going on there, you know. So the so narcissism of minor difference, Freud called it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, to Sorry, respect to, Dr. Lit, to respect go. Robin's point, and then I should probably go. Is is I I think we need to think more. The reason why I'm skeptical of community as opposed to group is. Um, I think we need to think in terms of literate religious experts who are individuals. Very few people wrote in the ancient world. Um, well, very few people read and even fewer people wrote. So what we have is the product that's left behind are the manuscripts of literate intellectuals and they don't represent the people on the bottom of the period uh, pyramid, uh, which as, as Justin explained it. Um, and, you know, we're, when we're thinking about debates, I think we're mostly thinking of, in my view, debates between individual literate religious ex experts who may or may not have led groups, 
and the people in their groups may or may not have agreed with their mm -hmm. teacher. You know, I mean, it's as if a, a pastor of a church wrote a treatise that survived 2000 years from now. I mean, we don't we shouldn't read that treatise as representing what everyone in the church thought. I mean, that could be 500 people or more. It's the literate ex expert who's giving the sermon. That's where we're getting the snapshot from. And so that's, you know, obviously he's he's dialoguing and in interaction with everybody else, but that's he's not representing them in any uh, in any official sense. And, you know, the, the last minor point is, I mean, it, it's always worth noting that, yes, we can posit groups, but all, all that survives, to my knowledge anyway, um, are the texts themselves. So we don't have things that we might have for, for other Christians. Uh, so we don't have remnants of hermetic buildings or artifacts or um, any kind of archaeology which we could do that would that would point toward distinctly hermetic groups. And as far as I know, we also don't have anyone in antiquity, correct me if I'm wrong, Justin, just outright saying, I am a hermetist. Uh, uh, but, Ludovico Lazzarelli is the first person to call them to call themselves that. Okay, excellent. Well, this is a great example of your knowledge uh, exceeding mine. And but yeah, it goes to show that you know we always have to be careful, and that's the mark of that's the mark of of scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, and I yeah, I I would rather talk about concrete social realities on the ground. Um, and and individuals proposing ideas rather than talking about like close knit, you know, groups of you know, thirty or forty, forty people. You know, same thing with the New Testament. You know, Paul writes a letter to the First Corinthians. I don't think any of the Corinthians actually agreed with Paul. I mean, <laughs> but but you know, he he gets to be the representative. <laughs> The unrepresentative representative of what what was going on in Corinth um, in in the, in the early fifties. So, anywho, um, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate Jason you having me on and Justin meeting you. And I hope this is just the beginning of many many meetings on this platform and on other platforms. And I am. Dearly sorry, but I am headed off to a Coptic lesson. <laughs> so on this Patreon, I'm... people, so go join Dr. Lit with Patreon <laughs> and Dr. Sledge's Patreon. They're Appreciate both, that. Yeah. Well uh, so yeah, someone is is making use of my my time and talents, which I am so glad to to offer. And I know Justin is doing probably a whole lot more. So anyway, I will sign off and uh, just thank you both. Awesome. Dr. Sledge, Dr. Litwa, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you both. Thank you both.